morning. What a beautiful group you are. Well, yes. Greg Carter, even you look good from this far away. So that's awesome. Awesome. We're glad to see you this morning. We're glad that you are here to worship the Lord and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with us as we come to this place. Uh, we hope that if you are a guest with us this morning for the first time or maybe the first time in a while, you would grab one of those guest cards from the pew pocket in front of you, fill that, fill that out. There is a drop box there at the back. You can put that in uh, as you're leaving this morning, and then we'll know that you've been here and sent you some information about our church through the mail. A couple of things to highlight very quickly for you. Out of your bulletin, today at 12.30, or right after our second service, we have our Vacation Bible School Workers Meeting. Miss Becky Beal, wait, Miss Becky, will be leading us through that. So if you're signed up to help in Vacation Bible School as an adult or one of our student helpers, we need you to come back. There'll be a little bit of lunch for you. Miss Becky will go through some information. You get a chance to meet with your team for a little bit. And VBS isn't very far away, so you'll want to come and be a part of that. Also, a reminder that Wednesday, this Wednesday, is our Praise at the Park, so we'll not have our normal functions here at the church. We will go to Webb Park and the church will provide hot dogs and hamburgers and uh, drinks and plates and stuff like that. You bring your side dishes and your lawn chairs and we'll all spread it all out and have a great time of fellowship together. We'll eat at 5.30. Then Daniel Brimer and his band will lead us in worship somewhere around 6.15ish. And so that'll be a good time. So come be a part of that. Praise team and choir will meet that night on an adjusted schedule. So check that in your bulletin if you would. Again, VBS is July 26th through the 30th. Help, help us get that word out. If you know kids who have completed either kindergarten all the way up through sixth grade, uh, get the enrollment forms to them. There's some at the doors or they can register online. We would love to have a building full on that week. Also, a reminder to our ladies that our women's retreat is August 13th and 14th. There should be a table downstairs today. You can go register and get your tickets for that. Also, Community Service League. All you students cover your ears right now, okay? Not you. School starts soon, and they're collecting school supplies, all right? So our kid, young people, you can cover your ears. They're collecting school supplies. There's a bucket just outside the church office. If you want to gather those things, list in the bulletin, bring them there. They would appreciate that to help those in our community. Also, one final announcement. If you just continue to be in prayer for our Children's Ministry Coordinator Search Committee, they've been elected and will meet soon as they've organized to begin that search process. Very important thing. Uh, so be in prayer for that committee and be in prayer for our children's ministry during the interim time as we continue to function and enlist leaders in those things. So I encourage you to pray about that. Right now, let's spend some time in prayer. Then Lincoln's going to come and lead our kiddos and our children's spotlights. So let's pray for a minute. So bow your heads, close your eyes, and carve out some time with just you and the Lord. And just ask God to challenge you today. To speak to you about the next step in obedience to what he's calling you to do. To go ahead and take away that thing he's been trying to take away. Or to put in that thing he's been trying to put into your life. And ask him to guide you to that next step of kingdom work that he has for you. That others may come to know him. Lord, as Father, thank you for being here. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to worship. Thank you for the freedoms that we have. God, thank you for calling us to be your children. And to be your ambassadors to a lost and dying world. We submit ourselves to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if all the kiddos would go ahead and come this direction, Mr. Lincoln Hipsher, summer youth intern extraordinaire, is going to lead you in the children's spotlight. All right. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. A couple more of you. Anybody in the back? Don't be nervous. I see some more. You guys can sit closer if you want. You can stay there. All right. <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about money. Mm. Not really, kind of. Um, right here, I've got this bill. Any of you want this? 
Yeah. Okay, so you know, you go buy some candy, buy a, buy a toy or something. It's fake. Why, don't, why do you think that you couldn't take this to the store and buy something? So, what you got? It's monopoly money. It's monopoly money. It's fake. You can't use this. It's not real. You don't want that. But then, say, I pull this out of my pocket. I get to it. Boom. Hello? Am I still here? I'm here. We got real money now. Look at that. Crisp Lincoln. Get it? My name's Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> now with this, how do you know that this can be used at the store? How do you know? It's real. It's double-sided. Abraham Lincoln's on the front. You got the, the seal, the treasury symbol. So you know this is a real bill because you've seen a real bill. A real bill, you know what it feels like and everything, right? But as real as this bill is, some people still try to copy it. They still try to um, copy the money, copy the, the paper, the feel, the look of it, and make counterfeit money. And when you look at that bill, you may not know that it's counterfeit from the outside, right? So the Bible kind of says a little bit of the same thing. Um, and it talks about how from the outside, we can look like real Christians and we can go to church, and we can do all the Christian things, but we can't fool God because he can see inside into our heart. So in a real bill, there's um, different fibers, and they have a security symbol so that they hold it up to the light, and they can tell if it's real or fake. It's the same thing with God. We might be able to fool all of these people, and you might be able to fool your, your friends and your parents, and... Um, make yourself look like a real Christian, but God's always going to be able to see it inside. So I'm going to challenge you guys um, to not be uh, counterfeit Christians or fake Christians. That's what counterfeit means, just fake. Um, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his, na of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outside, outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So just like I said with the money, um, it might look real, but then, um, and you might look real, but God can see inside your heart. He doesn't see what um, other people see. So just as you guys are going out throughout the week, and parents, you can help them with this, um, just... Try to not be counterfeit Christians and um, really try to live your life for Christ. And I'm going to pray for you guys and then we will continue. Uh, bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for this mini lesson um, on just trying to live our lives for you, uh, not be counterfeit Christians, but to do everything we can to proclaim your name and show. Uh, Show the people around us, show the loved ones that we have in our lives that we live for you and everything we do is for you and for the will of, um, of you. Uh, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joel Vanderpool. Uh, I've been helping out with the youth group for about a month now, leading worship and uh, Joel's been asking me, and I finally had a Wednesday free, and so did it, and came, and I texted him afterwards, and I said, I haven't had that much fun doing worship music in a long time, so I've uh, been doing it ever since, and then he asked me to help out this Sunday, so uh, rise and worship with us. <laughs>
for gathering each and every one of us here. I pray, Lord, that you can speak through Joel and his message and that you can lead um, the people of this congregation to open up their hearts to you to hear whatever it is that you want them to hear. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, good morning. How are we? Well, let's get a little louder. How are we? Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Um, if we haven't been able to meet, my name is Joel Carpenter. I'm the student pastor here. And I'm just going to give you um, a quick thing. I am a quick talker. I talk quick. So you're going to have to, to, to keep up with me, buckle up, because you're in for a ride with how quick I talk. But with that being said, I'm extremely glad uh, to be here. I'm extremely glad to be the student pastor here. I love what I do. Um, and so uh, I got the opportunity to preach, and so when I get the opportunity to preach, I do not say no. So uh, with that being said, if you're new here, we're extremely glad that you are here, and if you're coming back, welcome back. Um, but with that being said, um, if, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to the book of Job, to the book of Job, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And if you're new to the Bible, Job is in the Old Testament, it's the first half of your book, and you'll find that kind of in the middle um, of it if you open it up. Um, but while you're turning there, um, just a quick thing. I, I used to work at a daycare. Um, some of the worst memories and some of the best memories. Um, but I did work at a daycare. And I worked there for about four and a half years. I don't know why. But I did it. And I love this, the kids there, and I still see a lot of those kids um, actually around here in Oak Grove. Um, but something that constantly happened quite often is a kid would get hurt. A kid would like be running and then boom, hit their face, you know. Mm -hmm. They'd be running, scrape their knee. Um, or they'd just get hit, hurt by the other kid. Like the other kid would just be fed up and, you know, leave me alone. They'd push him over. It's like, hey, you can't do that, right? Um, sometimes you felt that way, like, uh, you shouldn't do that, but I felt, I felt that, you know. And so, uh, that's not funny. All right, so, but with that being said, so there's this one instance that we were in like, the, it was a big room, so basically when you walk into this specific daycare, um, it's just one massive room, and they kind of divide it into shelves, which, you know, this is twos and fours, this is, you know, threes and two fives or whatever, and, and so we go in there, and they're coming in from playing outside, and I see this little girl, and she's just having the time of her life playing with these, these little baby dolls, and she's like, ah, this is awesome, and she's running and showing her her little babies, and then all of a sudden, bang, she trips. She hits her face, and her nose starts bleeding a little bit. Now, at first, it wasn't that bad, okay? It wasn't bad at all until the other worker's like, oh, my gosh, she's bleeding. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why are you freaking out, right? And so, because I'm over here like, I, I don't have much sympathy when a kid gets hurt. I don't. I'm just like, you're fine. Like, unless it's something major, I'm like, you're fine. You're good. Like, ah, just a little bit of blood. Wipe it up. So I'm like, you're fine. She doesn't notice that she's bleeding yet. And so she's bleeding. I'm like, you're fine, not a big deal. And then the other leader or the other, you know, daycare worker sees it and she starts freaking out. I'm like, well, now the other, now the kid's freaking out. Now she's like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I'm bleeding. I'm like, I'm dying. And the, she's like, you're dying. And I'm like, no, they're not. Like, just go get a napkin, get it a little bit wet and shove it up her nose and we'll be all right. And so, and she was. Honestly, she came back the next day and she was thriving. And so I tell you that story because one, it happened really often. It happened all the time. But I tell you that story because really, if you think about it, um, that's a lot of us today, right? We're one or the other. Either we are the little kid and the crazy, you know, worker who's like, oh my gosh, you're bleeding and we see suffering or we see the situation and we began to freak out. Or you're like me and you're just like, here's the solution. Go and get it done. Like it's, you're not, it's not going to make or break you. Just go get the napkin. <coughs> Put it like on the wound, and you're going to be okay. And the reason why I tell you that story is because we're going to look at Job. And if you don't know much about Job, Job was a righteous, he was a legit, he was awesome dude. But he experienced suffer suffering. And he didn't respond in the way that the kid did, but he responded in the way really that I did. He wrestled with suffering. And he began to look to the solution. And so if you're new to the Bible, if you're even new to church, what you're going to find in the book of Job is that you're going to see suffering. And you're going to see Job wrestle with suffering. And instead of resting in that and, and having just a hissy fit and beginning to blame God, this is your fault, and beginning to freak out, he begins to solve it by looking to the solution. 
because what he sees is that ultimately the God of creation begins to look at him and says, hey, I have this solution. And so what really what we're going to find here is this, that Job is not really meant to ask or answer the question of why suffering happens. But Job is actually going to point us to the person who suffered the most on our behalf. Uh, believe it or not. And we're going to see that at the end of this message this morning. But if you are there, um, we're going to be in chapter 2. And we're going to see three things this morning. One, in verses 1 through 8, we're going to see the test. That Job is tested beyond measure. And actually in chapter 2, this is the second time that he has been tested. In, verses, in verse 9, we're going to see the, the, the temptation. That God allows testing to happen, but, it, but he also sees that Satan is a tempter, and he begins to tempt Job. And then in verse 10, we're going to see the response, the response of Job. And really, after those three things, we're going to see the first shadow of somebody greater than Job. And so with that being said, um, if you're there, Job 2, 1 through 8, it writes this. It said, One day the sons of God came again to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before the Lord. Now the Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming the ground through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Now this is the second time he's offered up Job. Now no one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. He still retains his integrity even though you incited me against him. To destroy him for no good reason. Skin for skin, Satan answered the Lord. A man will give up everything he owns in exchange for his life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you and in your face. Very well, the Lord told Satan, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence and infected Job with terrible boils and the soils of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself while he sat among the ashes. One, we're going to see the test. Now, if you look at this, um, right, right from the start, you, you don't see it really until you begin to actually like really dive, dive deep. Satan has to become like come before the Creator. So one, we see the, the authority of God already in the very first verse of chapter 2. That God is ultimately stomping on his authority. and He's saying, you can't even go past as much as I allow you to. So Satan, from the beginning of it, Satan is also under the authority of the creator. So really, nothing is out of bounds for God. God can do whatever he needs to, and he will allow whatever needs to happen. But ultimately, when we see suffering, Satan only allows temptation and those things to only go as far as, as God allows and so that's one spectacular thing we see already in the book of Job, is that God is ultimately flexing his authority over Satan. And already in the moment, he's already flexing his authority over creation. And he says, I do what I want, when I want, and I work it however I want. This is how God works. And so Satan comes before God, he asks God, and this is what happens. You see, in this story, we see a bold and radical assault on God and godly people in a special and intimate relationship that is dearest to them both. You see, when God calls up the name of Job before the accuser, Satan himself, and testifies to his righteousness, Satan attempts with one crafty thrust to both destroy God's beloved and to show up God as a fool. And Satan accuses Job before God. I mean, the audacity of Satan to come before the Creator and to tempt him and to tell him this is what's going to happen, and God responds. He charges that Job's godliness is ultimately fake, evil, and the very godliness in which God takes such delight lacks all integrity. That Job's godliness is mere self-serving, that it's ultimately for the benefit of him, that only that he gets what, what, what basically he wants. So if I'm good... If I'm faithful towards God, I'm going to utilize that against him so that I can get what I want. So Satan's ultimately telling God, Satan's ultimately abusing, or like Job is ultimately abusing his power. He's showing to be faithful while also receiving what he wants. If God will only allow Satan to tempt Job by breaking the link between righteousness and blessing, he will expose Job and all the righteous people as the frauds that they are. And that it is the adversary's ultimate challenge. 
He is sure that he has found an opening to accomplish his purpose in the very structure in all of creation. So one truth is found not only through the test, but we find in this story that Satan, if you are a follower of Jesus, is not fond of your life's mission. In fact, he is threatened by your mission, and because of that, he will attack you. He will go before the Creator, and he will say, can I do this? And God will allow whatever happens, but ultimately, Satan is threatened when you are a faithful follower of Jesus. He is threatened when you begin to ponder on who Jesus is. He is threatened when you actively live out of faith that is glorifying to Jesus. Satan can't stand the thought of Jesus winning. Satan can't th stand the thought of Job being faithful. And so what, so what does Satan do? He accuses Job before God's very presence and says, Job is nothing. He is not righteous. He is unworthy. And he will fail you. I promise you that. And so what does God do? He allows things to happen. We find in this story, we also find that humans are totally dependent on God for their very lives. And well-being, that the fact can lead to the greatest temptation in this season right now. That we can be tempted to love the gifts rather than the giver. To love the blessing more than the one giving the blessing. To try to please God merely for the sake of his benefits. To be religious and good and only because it pays. And Satan accuses, the, accuses Job of this right before God. And so the accusation now raised cannot be ignored nor can it be silenced. Not even by destroying Satan himself, the accuser. It strikes too deeply into the very structure of creation and is rooted too deeply in the human condition. So God lets Satan have his way, but with spe specific limits. So ultimately, Satan can only do as much as God allows. Again, showing that he is ulti the ultimate authority. And then from this comes Job's profound anguish. We're going to find throughout the rest of this story not just in chapter 2, but 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 42, Job struggles. He has anguish. He struggles. He begins to ask God why. But one thing we do find to be true is God that Job never turns his back on the Creator. And so what we find is God tests for, you, for your benefit and for His glory, and Satan tempts for your destruction and ruin. That God uses a season of testing to glorify him and to ultimately, Lord willing, push you closer to him. And so Job is in the moment, and Job has one of two choices. I can either run from God and say, this is your fault, or I can finally surrender my life down and trust that what you're doing in this season is not only for my benefit, but ultimately is for your glory, and you're going to do whatever you need to do because it's about you. See, even Satan is under the authority of God. And so Jesus will ultimately have the final word, and, and Job is confident in that. And so there's, a, there's somebody here, um, his name's Bill Kim, he's a member of this church. He once uh, like put this on Facebook, and this has stuck with me, and this has been, I think, about two years since he wrote this. But he said this, he said, Friends, we never know what tomorrow will include. Profit, loss, pleasure, pain, glory, shame, we just don't know, but we can prepare our response for whatever is ahead by doing this one simple yet impossible thing. Trust God. You see, Job, he looked at the, the season that he was in. Now, now, granted, Job not only was now being physically attacked, but he had already lost all his possessions and some of his loved ones in the moment, and he was still faithful. And so what does Satan do? He sees that Job is faithful. He goes back before God and says, hey, I promise you if I get him again, he's going to turn his back on you. And God with confidence says, no, he won't. See, the presence of pain to Job and for you, the presence of pain and suffering is not the absence of a heavenly father. It reminds us of our need of a heavenly father. It serves as a reminder that we need Jesus Christ to come and make all things right again. Amen. That in this story of Job, God isn't far. He is extremely near, even though Job feels as though he's far away. And in your presence of suffering, when you're struggling and things are kind of getting, you know, rough, God is not running away from you like you are. He's running towards you. And he's waiting for you to come back so that he can make all things right again. And so Job, we see he is tested greatly. But also we see in verse 9 that he is tempted. In verse 9 it writes this. It writes, His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. So like now the wife's given up. 
Like, he, she's just given up completely. Like, we've lost our kids. We've lost all our possessions. Now your health has been attacked. Just curse him, run away, and go die. And what, is, uh, what do we do? He, we find that Job chooses, in the midst of being tempted, to run near God, not further away. That his wife, the human nearest to his heart, proposed that he should just curse God and run. But what ultimately pains him the most is his apparent alienation from him. That God, he seems as though God is far, but really God is extremely near. For some of you, you've been tempted in a season of suffering. Listen, suffering is going to happen whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And when you pray, when you beg God for something, you beg him that he would be glorified in the end, whether it benefits you or whether it doesn't. That ultimately it would be a representation of, yeah, I, 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 like I've experienced something that is great and I've lost a lot of things, but ultimately in the end is God glorified. You see, how dare we get angry or think God didn't hear our prayer or cry simply because he didn't do what we said or give us a better life than we have or do what we needed in the moment. See, God will do whatever he needs to do to get your attention, and God will do whatever he needs to do to show that he is ultimately the one who deserves to be glorified. It is about God, not us. Amen. See, the gospel and what we see within all of scripture, the gospel depends on God and a God who is not dependent on you. That ultimately what Jesus Christ did on the cross is dependent on God, not dependent on us. And so we find this already within the book of Job, that, test, that the testing will happen. But Satan ultimately will tempt you for your destruction and ruin. And we have to respond in a way that is worthy of the call that God has placed on our life. And so what do we find Job do? Job looks at his wife and basically he's like, you're insane. Like, what are you doing? Like, why, why in the world would I turn my back on the God who has never left my side in the moment? Though he feels as though he has. He hasn't. And so the challenge is this, is we should not waste our suffering because it, could just, it just could be the making of our faith. That Job, he did not waste his suffering for it was the making of his own faith. That when we are called to follow Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, you either follow all of him or nothing. Every pain, every disappointment, and every time suffering hits, you follow him, all of him, or none of him. And what does Job do? When the temptation hits, he runs. Not away, but to God. And he looks at his wife, and he thinks, you're insane. Like, why would you do that? Like, if God got us out of the season of losing some of our loved ones, if God got us through the season of losing every possession that we own, why would he now dip out now? Why would he run and leave us now? And so we see in verses 1 through 8, the test. In verses 9, we see the temptation. But then ultimately in verse 10, we see the response. And this is what Job says. He says, you speak as a foolish woman speaks, he told her. Should we accept only good from God and not um, adversity? Throughout all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. Now look at the response in verse 20 in chapter 1. Job writes this. After he's lost everything he owns, he says this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. The response from Job is a response that I need Jesus in the moment. That is a response of everything I have is yours, whether you choose to take that away or whether you choose to give it to me. Job is showing us something, that when suffering hits, you can respond in a way that is worthy of a manner that is glorifying to Jesus. And that's saying, I need you and that's it. You don't lean on your possessions. You don't lean ultimately on what he's given you. You lean on who he is and what he has done. That the adversary is silence and God's delight are in God and is in the godly people. That robbed of every sign of God's favor, Job refuses to repudiate his maker. That he looks at his wife and he say, he basically pushes her to the side and he says, I'm following Jesus. He faces towards God with anguish, puzzlement, and anger and bitter complaints, but he never turns his back on God. We'll find throughout the rest of this book, the rest of these chapters, that Job does struggle with anguish, anguish puzzlement. He does complain at times, but he never, ever runs from his creator. 
because he understands as much as God's making him mad, the only way to salvation and the only way for him to be okay is with God present in his season and in his life. His whole being yearns not for God's gifts as such, but for the sign of God's favor. He just wants to know, is God, are you there? And if you're there, would you make your presence known? I wonder, when is the last time you have looked at God in your season of suffering and said, just be near? <laughs> like, just be present. Like, you don't have to give me this. You don't even have to fix the problem. But are you, are you here? Like, are you present in the season that is most difficult for me? See, Job, he doesn't focus on his temporary. He doesn't focus on the specific season that he's in. He focuses on his eternal because he knows he holds his eternal. David Platt, a great author and one of the most famous pastors right now, writes this. He says, when you lose some of the best and most valuable things this world has to offer, and in the middle of suffering you have joy and peace and hope because Christ is in your life, then the world will take notice of that. That ultimately when Christ is your life, that's it. And when suffering hits, you can wrestle well with suffering. You don't always have to have an answer of why the suffering happened. Why do bad things happen? But you can ultimately wrestle with suffering and be reminded that suffering points you to your need of a Savior, of a Heavenly Father. Not because He's not present, because He is present. Bob Goff, another author, would say this, that the way we deal with uncertainty or suffering says a lot about whether Jesus is ahead of us leading or just behind us carrying our stuff. Is God author and leader of your life? When suffering hits, are you trying to take the reins or is he the one leading? And you follow after him no matter where that might take you. You see in Matthew 8, we see the storm that was crazy and the disciples began to freak out. But the disciples cried out only five words and Jesus calmed the storm. Jesus answers even your smallest requests in the midst of your suffering. Why not run to him? Because when we see suffering hit, time cannot heal all wounds, but Jesus can. So why not run to him? You see, Job had confidence that God was going to fix what was broken, even when he did have bitter complaints, even when he did doubt every once in a while. But one thing he didn't do, which we can take after, he never ran from his creator. Because he ultimately knew that the Creator was his only hope for the season that he was in. How would you respond when suffering hits? How have you responded when suffering hits? You see, we see the test from God. We see the temptation from Satan. We see the response, the incredible response from Job. But ultimately, we see the story points to the foreshadow of a king. A great king, in fact. However, Job's experience makes bitterly clear to him and us that we cannot fathom tr the truth of the situation nor the truth of suffering. That when suffering hits like a brick in the face, we are often at a loss of understanding. But Job turns to God and demands of God an explanation, and God responds, all right. God responds in chapter 32, and he ultimately says, where were you when I created the foundations of the earth? Surely you know. And Job steps back, and he's like, oh my gosh. Like the fact that I would question the creator God ultimately stomps again on, on the, the doubt that is running through the veins of Job. And he says, look at me. If I know when the seasons hit, when the waves stop, and I can, on a dime, turn it light to dark, then I promise you I can handle your suffering. But ultimately, he's saying that the job is not done, Job. That I know your season is difficult, but there is another season here that is coming. And Matthew, that is about to be far worse than the season that you're facing. You are only a foreshadow of a greater king that is coming. That God, he doesn't owe us an explanation every time he does something we don't understand. Our job is to trust in the midst of whatever makes or doesn't make sense. And so Job is meant to give us a specific reason for suffering. It is not, it's not meant to give us a specific reason for suffering. But instead, Job points us to the person who suffered perfectly. On our behalf. In the end, the adversary is silence. Job's friends are silence. Job is silence, but God is not, because God was not done yet. You see, we see actually five things within the book of Job that foreshadow a coming king, a greater king, King Jesus. We see that both are righteous, but only one is perfect. Job was righteous in relative terms. Jesus was righteous in absolute terms, free from all sin. When Jesus was tempted, he never failed. But when Job, in Job 13, was tempted, 
he did fail. That Job, he actually begins to ponder on, on the sins of his youth, showing that Job was not perfect. He couldn't do what Jesus could do. That we see, too, that both had suffered. Not only did Job lose his family and possessions, he suffered physical pain. His blackened skin full of sores disfigured him beyond recognition. His pain would not let him sleep in Job 30. And before his death, Christ also endured horrible body pains. Being whipped to the point of not even looking human, wearing a crown of thorns and the torture of the crucifixion itself, but more suffering followed Job. He was accused by his friends, scorned, mocked, just as like Jesus was likewise, faced, mocking, <coughs> betrayal, both from the crowds and even from his close friends. And here's the difference, though. God allowed Job to live. In contrast, God did not spare his own son. That Jesus Christ was the ultimate servant who suffered and made payment for Job's sin as well as ours. That Job had only thought that God had abandoned him, but Christ was in fact abandoned by his heavenly father so that he could take the sins of the world on his shoulders. R.C. Spool, a great theologian, would say this, that because of Christ's suffering is not useless. It's a part of the total plan of God who has chosen to redeem the world through the pathway of suffering. And that Christ suffered on our behalf so we could experience the answer of why suffering happens. Because God ultimately wants us to be pointed towards him. Three, a spiritual battle was present. That the suffering of Job had a hidden spiritual component. Satan questioned Job's loyalty to God, and God allowed Satan to test Job. But Jesus was engaged in even a greater spiritual battle. It was a contest for the fate of the world itself. In reality, Jesus was paying the penalty for our blasphemy, our treason against the God of the universe. Four, restoration took place. In chapter 42, God restores Job's fortune, blessing him with double the wealth and a full house of children over the years. But even more miraculously, in Luke 24, we find God raises Jesus from the dead. But it doesn't stop there because, Christ, because of Christ's obedience. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Just as Job's family was restored to him, the suffering of Jesus restores the heavenly family. And the last thing is this, is both intercede, but only one can save. Job is not Jesus, but Jesus is Jesus. As the book of Job concludes, God rebukes Job's friends for the speaking improperly. In Job 42, God then instructs the friends to make sacrifices and have Job pray for them. Job, the righteous who suffered, intercedes for his friends and pleaded for God's mercy. But in Hebrews 7 and Romans 8, we see that in Jesus Christ is the even greater intercessor. That Christ is at God's right hand, praying for us eternally. That the gospel depends on a God who doesn't depend on you, church. That in the midst of your suffering, you run to Jesus because Jesus is everything you need. That Job points us to the greatest king. The greatest king to ever walk the face of the earth. That Jesus wins battles not by shedding the blood of his enemies, but by shedding his very own blood for his enemies. He is a king that is unstoppable. This is the essence of who King Jesus is. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of all glory. Jesus Christ is the king of kings, and yes, he is the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is a sovereign king. No mind can fully comprehend the greatness of King Jesus, the glory of who he is. This Jesus is awesome. He is perfect, unique, tender, and yet strong. He is loving, sincere, honest, powerful, humble, intentional, steadfast, merciful, and yet he is also graceful. He's the greatest king that the world has ever known, and he's the son of the living God. He's the savior of the world we didn't know we needed, yet desperately cannot live without. He's the only way to salvation. There is no other way. He is the protector, Alpha, Omega, the great I Am. He is deliverer, defender, provider, counselor, prince of peace. He is the beauty in all of scripture of what, and the essence of why we live and why we breathe. The only one who is willing to do the unthinkable and pull off the impossible. He, is the, he and his kindness give strength to the weak, pursues the outcast while graciously forgiving the tired and weary sinner. He is hope for the hopeless, rest for the weary, help for the hurting. He sustains in the midst of turmoil, sympathizes with the broken, saves the wretched sinner while holding and sustaining all of creation within the palm of his hand. He is the life giver, death the defeater. He guides the one back who has lost their way while simultaneously healing the one who is sick. 
He is the judge that proceeds to take off his robe and pay the price that you and I deserve. Jesus Christ is the only clean king that leads to a pathway of peace, joy, holiness, salvation, certainty in the midst of chaos and happiness in the midst of despair. He is the bread of life, the way, the truth, and the life, the good shepherd who lays down his life. He is the king who is not just the way maker. He's not just a miracle worker, but he thrives in his promise king, promise keeping. King Jesus is the definition of goodness, of mercy, of grace. Jesus is everlasting and never changing. Jesus Christ is the only king who offers himself in the midst of suffering and in the middle of your storm. Jesus Christ is king. Do you know this king? Job knew this king. Job was broken. He was jacked up. He was tested, he was tempted, but he responded in a way that ultimately pointed Christ as King and Lord of your life. I don't know where you're at this morning, but to come into a church and try to act like you have it all figured out and button up a shirt and act like things are going your way. Listen, the church is meant for people who are jacked up and broken to come before the altar and say, God, I need you, just as Job did the exact same thing. And when your spouse is telling you to curse God and die, look what you do. You do what Job did. You run to Jesus. When you're tempted, you run to Jesus. You see, God has never looked in your mirror and wished he saw someone else. You are enough. You are loved. You are his. And you can own that. For some of you, you need to make a response now to say, God, you are my life, and I need you to be Lord and Savior of my life. For others of you, you're dealing with some suffering, and you don't know how to handle it. I don't have an answer for you on how to handle it, but I do have an answer of who I can point you to in the midst of your suffering, that's Christ. See, he can sympathize with you in a way that I've never seen before, but also he can love you and put you, put people in your place to love you well when suffering hits. For others of you, you have to make a decision, man, should I attend a church? Do I need to make this a daily thing in my life? Yeah, you do. Because life without Jesus is not really life at all. That you need Jesus more than you know. I promise you that the gospel is inviting you home this morning because the gospel depends on a God who doesn't depend on you. How are you going to respond? Whether you've been here forever or whether you're new to the church, listen, God looks at you in the midst of your suffering. And he not only loves you well, but he points you to himself. Why? Because that is the most loving thing he could ever do. Why not take that up? And why not respond in a way that would be ultimately worthy of of who he is. And ultimately, to be honest here, it will benefit you because you get all of Jesus. And so this is what I want to close with. When somebody asks you, hey, on what basis, on what basis do you belong in the kingdom of heaven? Can your response, is your response this? The man on the middle cross said that I am welcome. If that is you, welcome home. If that's not you, would you begin to ponder on where am I with Jesus and would Jesus radically change your life this morning? And would if suffering hit, test come, temptation happen, would you respond the way Job did? I need Jesus and that's it. Let's pray. King Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you are a God who loves us, that you are a God who pursues us and when suffering hits, you don't give us a question of why suffering happens, but you ultimately point us to the person who suffered on our behalf, and that's Jesus Christ. Thank you for how you've constantly worked in the life of this church, in the lives of these people, and how you're actively working even right now in the hearts of people who are running away from you, but now maybe even tiptoeing towards you, because you are reminding them of the goodness of the gospel. You're reminding them of the goodness of who you are, and you are ultimately reminding them that your plan is far greater than their own, so why not just give it up and allow you to do incredible work for your glory, for their benefit, and so that the world can see that the God of creation isn't some fake person, but he is real. And you are authoritative, you are powerful, and you are ultimately calling us home to be with you forever. So would we respond faithfully? We believe that your word doesn't that your word demands a response. And so would that response be something that not only would be honoring to you, but that would be real genuine and honest. Thank you for this time. Thank you for um, this church. Thank you for this congregation. And thank you for the fact that we can stand in a building like this and we can lift your name higher than every other name. Why? Because you are worthy. And thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me, please.
As we stand together this morning, God's speaking to your heart through this, his word, through the wonderful message. Uh, he's calling you. And what's he calling you to? Calling you to draw close to him, calling you to trust him in your circumstances, calling you to come to salvation. We're gonna be here at the front. And while the lights are coming on, you'll be able to see the way. Uh, while the house lights come on, we'll, you, you'll be able to see the way. And you come and, and make your response. Our worship team's gonna lead us as we sing. And it is God speaking to your heart for whatever reason. You come to Jesus. The same.
but the lack of understanding just really gets in the way sometimes. If you just slip your hand up, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, you slip your hand up right now, just to God, okay? All right. Okay. Father, you know the circumstances that we're all going through. And we want to trust you. We want to come to that place where we're not leaning on our own understanding, but in all our ways we're trusting you, God, so that we can see the straight path that you have for us. Lord, that's what we're. That's what we want in our hearts. And I pray for each one of these, Lord, that they would sense your presence in a mighty way they would know that you are a God that walks through the fire with us, not around it. So we can see on the other side. But you walk with us. I pray for him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Right now, before we introduce these people who made decisions, Jelena, if you'll come and stand here with me. And I, I'm going to ask you if you would just be seated for a minute. Jolena is coming today uh, asking for prayer. This is a transition time of the year between now and September as uh, our leaders are seeking new volunteers for the next church year. We start our church year in regard to leadership from September 1st around to the last of August. And so she's going to be in search of some preschool and children's workers. Uh, she leads in our department in that area, and uh, she is looking for workers who are going to replace those that either by natural attrition have, have gone, uh, moved on or they just felt like that that season in their life is, is over. And, and so she wants us as a church to pray with her uh, as she's looking for new workers. And if God speaks to your heart, if God puts it on your heart, hey, I need to step up. I need to step up and be willing to give uh, every Sunday the next year. Uh, and, and she's been very good to have substitutes when the, those one or two Sundays that you can't be here come along. But, uh, but you can step out and say, God's calling me to work in our children and preschool cool area, uh, then you respond. And you can come, you'll know who to come to. You can come to Joe Lanner, come to one of us, and we'll get you with her. Uh, but right now, I want us to pray for this. And so, Joe Lanner, if you'll stand out, and we're praying for all of our children in preschool now, uh, because both those areas are going to be needing needing new workers. And in fact, all of the Sunday schools are going to be needing workers uh, all the way up and down. And God is going to be speaking to your heart. He provides through the body. But I'd like for you to come and just stand around Joelena, and we're going to pray for this issue and pray that God would put it on people's heart, his people's heart. And Father, I just want to come to you on behalf of the church. What a privilege it is to uh, be a part of this fellowship and, and to be a part of, of the greatest serving force in the whole world, the body of Christ. And we pray, God, in, in this local church, this local body of Christ here that makes up First Baptist Oak Grove, that you would put it on our hearts, those that you are calling that you're calling to work in our preschool, Sunday school, in our children's Sunday school, and any other area, our youth Sunday school, our adult Sunday school, Lord, any area, we just pray that you would put it on our hearts and we would know clearly that you're calling us. And then, God, I pray that people would have the faith to choose to answer your call, that they would not turn their back on you, but they would, they would, face you and say, I am, here am I, just like Isaiah old. Here am I, send me. Lord, we just pray this. Thank you for Jolene and her putting this on her heart to lead us as the body of Christ to cry out to you for these leaders. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jolena, for leading that. And, and just as a matter of information, uh, we're sending out a note to all of our leaders in, in the church because we're also planning for 2022 uh, calendar of ministry and for budget. And so just be praying as all of our leadership gets at these things uh, these days. I've got some people to introduce to you right now. So first, Lauren, you and Madeline come and stand here. Chris, you come and stand with them. You know, I, I, I love to preach, you know, and I've gotten to preach all over the world to many, many people. But I, I love nothing better than to one-on-one -on -one be able to help uh, lead people to know Jesus as Savior. That's my most favorite thing in the world to do. And Chris Vesos has been getting the privilege to do that. Well, firstly, because he's yielded himself. He's felt his, the call on his heart and life. And, uh, and so these are two that God has used Chris to lead to Jesus. And Lauren and Madeline have both said, I want Jesus to be in my heart. Amen. And so amen. <laughs> and uh, I, I, Madeline came across the street the other night and told me about it. And I saw Chris over there sitting with her. And then Chris called me and said, Lauren, he wants to follow Jesus. And so it's just been exciting to, to hear about these decisions. And, uh, you know, I'd love to think that it's my preaching that does, you know. <laughs> but most of the people, 90, probably 99, 98%, Brother Brad, we've done these studies, happen out there. They happen out there. And we get to present them publicly here. And so this is great. I just bless the Lord. And they would like to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. And if you would authorize Chris, who's one of our ordained deacons, if you'd authorize him to baptize these two, let the Lord know it by a big hand of applause. <laughs> And, and Chris has already cleared it with them. They, they, they're going to trust him not to drown him when he's in the ministry. Anyway, amen. And then, Rod, you come and stand right here. And I want Oscar and Dean to stand by Rod. Rod is from California. He's been a good friend of Oscar and Dean for many, many years. And he's been staying with them for the last month, month and a half. Um, got a text and they said we're going to see Jesus and I knew they were in Branson so I know what knew what play they were going to mm -hmm. they were going to <laughs> sat in the lighting and uh, uh, and, and the, they went to see that play but uh, before that before they went last weekend uh, they called and said Randy could you come down for a second well Oscar and Dick have been talking to Rod about Jesus for the last year, year and a half, as they've talked on the phone. And I thought, well, I prayed for, I prayed for you, Rod, because I knew when you came to spend this month, month and a half with them, they've been going through the disciples' path, and I prayed for you that they wouldn't be too overwhelming because their <laughs> their hearts are pumping with Jesus, Oscar and Dick. They just live right down the neighborhood from me. But she called and I said, wow, Rod, Rod has caved in to, to, to what Jesus is doing in their life. And uh, Rod said, I want Jesus to be my Savior. And so, amen. <laughs> and you know, the sinner's prayer uh, is a tool. There's no prayer that saves us. There's not any activity on our part that saves us. Jesus saves us. And God uses our faith when we give in, we believe. He uses our faith. But Jesus is the Savior. And, uh, and Rod, he prayed uh, with us that sinner's prayer, confessing 
that he's given his heart to Jesus. But the truth is, he had already yielded his heart to Jesus. He was just confessing it with his mouth. And Paul says something about that in Romans chapter 10. And it helps hold our feet to the fire. And so Rod would also like to be a candidate for baptism. And he, we're going to try to get at that baptism next Sunday morning. If you would support Rod's decision as he's come to Christ as Savior and to be a candidate for baptism, would you again stand with me and let's give the Lord a big hand again. Amen. Listen, listen to me. You may not feel like you can preach up here, but you can, you can get around people and talk to them about what Jesus is doing in your life. I came in this morning and Patty grabbed me by the arm and she said, Brother Randy, I'm praying for some folks, some family. And I'm praying that they give their heart to Jesus. And she was just saying, I know I'm not as good as I can be and all this. She's out there talking about Jesus, though. And it's on her heart. So we just pray for those people. And uh, Patty, that, that's going to, God's heard that prayer. And uh, so all of us can get in on doing this, this stuff. Uh, Oscar says, I can't hardly pray. But when you hear him pray, he prays with his heart. All of us, God has called all of us to be a part of this. Last thing before I ask Don to come and, and uh, lead us in prayer. Let's give the Lord Jesus a big hand because he, Joel didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose Joel to be our youth pastor. And I'm glad you are Father, we have a lot to praise you for today, but just you alone is enough. Father, we thank you for the new brothers and sisters we have in Christ, and we thank you for their decisions, and uh, we just pray that we as a church family would uh, rally around them and uh, surround them and help disciple them. And Father, we praise you for the test that will come as Joel uh, preached. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you and realize there's no test that's out here that Satan's done that you can't overcome. Bless us now as we go to Sunday school and uh, learn more about you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.